Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all and welcome to the International Conference India and the Indian Ocean Region, Dynamics of Geopolitics, Security and Global Commons. On behalf of the Peninsula Foundation, I would like to welcome everyone present here. We extend a very warm welcome to our Chief Guest, Vice Admiral Ashok Kumar, AVSM, VSM, Vice Chief of Naval Staff and Distinguished Delegates. I request our Chief Guest, Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Professor Kanti Bajpai, Dr. T.C.A. Raghavan, Dr. Lillian Jasper, and Air Marshal Mathesparan to please take their place on the dais. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Lillian I. Jasper, Principal, Women's Christian College, to deliver the welcome address. Good morning. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the International Conference on India and the Indian Ocean Region, Dynamics of Geopolitics, Security and Global Commons, a topic which is of relevance and interest to all of us who share the Indian Ocean. I would especially like to welcome Vice Admiral Ashok Kumar, Vice Chief of Naval Staff for gracing the occasion. I would especially like to welcome Professor Kanti Bajpai, Dr. Padma Subramanian, Commodore Uday Baskar, Dr. Raghavan, IFS, Retired Vice Admiral Shekhar Sinha, Retired Air Marshal Mateeshwaran, Dr. Joshua Thomas, Retired Lieutenant General S. Narasimhan, and our friend Dr. Lawrence Prabhakaran, who are here. This conference has been organized through the joint effort of the Peninsula Foundation and the efforts of Mrs. Titi Elizabeth Phillips, Head of the Department, Department of History Women's College, Women's Christian College, and Dean of Women's Studies Center, and, uh, and other partners. I would also like to acknowledge the role of the fledgling Department of International Studies, whose presence on campus has been instrumental in our thinking of this initiative. I would like to welcome the interns from Peninsula Foundation, students and faculty from other departments, and the History Department of Women's Christian College. Wishing you all two vibrant days of exchange of ideas and fellowship in our Sylvan campus. Thank you for coming. Thank you, ma'am. I now invite Air Marshal M. Mathi Spiran, Chairman and President, the Peninsula Foundation, to deliver the presidential address and the conference overview. It's been a great pleasure that uh, we are on the inauguration of the first major conference that we have uh, initiated from the Peninsula Foundation. Uh, first of all, I would uh, you know, uh, welcome the Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral uh, Ashok Kumar, uh, AVSM, VSM, to have consented to grace the occasion as the chief guest today. And of course, Professor Kanti Bajpai, uh, who has agreed to give us, come all the way from Singapore to give us the keynote address. More importantly, uh, I thank Dr. Lillian Jasper for providing us the support and I'm sure this will uh, go a long way in, uh, uh, in uh, contributing to the knowledge and wealth uh, in, for the uh, college and the academic fraternity. It's a very important uh, you know, uh, to acknowledge the ex excellent support by Dr. T.C. Raghavan and ICWA, a conference partner, for to be able to put together this entire uh, event. Uh, let me first give a little bit of overview on the uh, Peninsula Foundation. It's a young, fledgling uh, uh, think tank. We just started two years ago, uh, but we have we've, uh, actually kept our ambitions and scope fairly wide. It's a public policy, non-profit, non-partisan public policy uh, research think tank that endeavors to look at uh, you know, research and education in areas of governance, in foreign policy and international relations and more importantly science, technology and security affairs. So we have uh, invited people to come and do internships with us. We are putting together a certain amount of uh, availability of faculty and we want to go away from your textbook, uh, you know, go beyond the textbook learning that you do in the colleges to be able to expand your horizons and bring awareness in the region. The very idea of the Peninsula Foundation is that, uh, you know, the concentration of think tanks in national capital, like in any other country, 
is huge. Ninety-eight percent of the think tanks are in Delhi, and uh, we also believe there is a tremendous orientation to continental approach and continental mindset when you look at things from Delhi. That needs to get complemented by India's view across the oceans, particularly in the context of its image and its rising stature, to actually look at beyond the oceans, look at its history, look at its civilizational strengths, look at its soft power, and look at its you know uh, influence that it had over the millenniums to be able to actually grasp what is the tremendous advantage with which India is geographically located and sitting amidst in the center of Indian Ocean. We actually are located, and if you look at history, the known world, the east, uh, western edge was the Mediterranean Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, and the eastern edge was the western Pacific. And the centerpiece of all human activity in terms of trade, civilizational interactions, influence, everything was carried on in the Indian Ocean region. It's only later, in the 19th and 20th centuries, that the center of gravity shifted off to the Atlantic. It's coming back to us again. And India, if you look at it geographically, as Jawaharlal Nehru said, it, it uh, described India's splendid isolation, gives it an enormous strength and advantage to be able to influence countries as it has done in the past. And that's what we need to grasp. How do we build our relations? How do we actually overcome our barriers? And how do we bring in strengths at the same time, 21st century is also, it's all about technology. And how do we understand where we are in terms of technology ladder? How do we actually grasp the sinews of getting technology controls, particularly in the context of breakout and innovative and disruptive technologies that are emerging in the 21st century? And these are all parts of our overall strategic mindset that needs to be built. Uh, and this is extremely important. So the very purpose of Peninsula Foundation is to look at these aspects and also provide an opportunity for people in the region so that they don't, everyone doesn't have to go around running around to Delhi but provide interactive process with Delhi as well as build centers in the peninsula to be able to provide you the opportunities to learn and develop a strategic mindset in the region. So this is our entire process. The conference itself focuses on three aspects. Dynamics of geopolitics which will focus on India's history, culture, civilization and the future of the 21st century in terms of emerging geopolitical competitions and, and how India needs to deal with it. The uh, security aspect will look at what are the competitive processes that are involved both with external powers and in the region and how India needs to deal with that part. And also the process of science and technology and its impact in this entire process. Third is more important in the context of global commons India needs to take the lead in ensuring a safe global environment, control of climate, you know, safeguarding in environmental issues, safeguarding the oceans. In all those contexts, I think India needs to play a role. As we very often say, can we play a role as a lead security provider? I think we need to go beyond that. Can we ensure that rules-based order, which is fair and genuine, is it developed and India leads the way in that process, at least in the Indian Ocean region. So this is the objective. The next two days, we've got very, very illustrious and very luminary speakers who agreed to come and speak to us. And this is what we expect actually to be covered in the next two days. And, and I, I'm sure we, you all will enjoy the conference over the next two days. Uh, I wish you all the very best and uh, uh, thank you for allowing us to host this conference today. Thank you. I now invite Air Marshal M. Mathieu Spiden um, to conduct the lighting of the lamp. As is tradition, we will now have the uh, delegates on the dais to please uh, light the lamp.
We'd also like to take this occasion to release a book written by one of our distinguished fellows, Dr. Kalyan Raman, well-known Indologist. I request you, sir, to please come on stage and hand over the first copy to the Vice Chief of Naval Staff and to say a few words about the book. Some brilliant fellow invented the idea of adding tin to copper. 
Where from? Where are the things coming from? The larger print part of the globe. See that map? Four map? The red lines? Mekong. Similar basis. Iravati Salvi is our basis. The whole instrument is carrying forward? India. The Indian merchants, seafaring merchants, meet up with this. Port Blair groups of regimes. A remarkable recovery uh, research done in the University of Hawaii has conclusively proved that the Mark Mayer languages emerged from Santali, Indian Ugarika languages. There is no doubt about that. So, it means there are a lot of interactions that are taking place along the Mekong River Delta, Iravadi Salvi River Delta, Rabaputra, Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Sindhu, Persian Gulf, Tigris Euphrates. So what we are seeing is a phenomenal possibility of an ancient maritime tin route which predated the Silk Road by two millennia. In the first millennium, you see, there is a tin route operating to create this thing. Now would you find it? See those three tin ingots. They were found in a high pressure shipwreck in Israel, in a port. What does it contain? Industrial. The industrial inscription say, they are in gods of tin. That is what it reads. We can question about it, but let us discuss. How did the tin in gods arrive in Israel? So, this is an investigation which links up the entire Indian Ocean as a vibrant activity in creating the wealth of nations. Next, please. <coughs> so, the Indian summary has been given as to how the wealth of nations arose. So, we can now rewrite Adam Smith and be able to determine that these 8,000 inscriptions of the civilization represent wealth accounting systems documenting the wealth creation activities by your ancestors. The seafaring merchants and the Aksa who created the branch of the civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd like to invite Air Marshal M. Mathesparan to introduce Vice Admiral Ashok Kumar, VCNS, who will be delivering the inaugural address. Uh, thank you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to again, uh, you know, uh, uh, invite the Vice Chief Naval Staff uh, to the conference again. And before I invite him to deliver the inaugural address, uh, let me uh, just go through his uh, bio data for everybody's benefit. The Vice Chief uh, is an alumni of the National Defense Academy, Karapasla. Let me also highlight here, we are also from the same school. And it's, we are very immensely proud that uh, we have uh, Vice Chief from uh, school background. We also have an Army Vice Chief from school background and very soon probably we will have some teams. Uh, the Admiral has held very challenging staff and command assignments uh, during his distinguished naval career spanning more than three decades. After having completed his specialization in navigation and direction at Kochi in 1989, he served in the navigate as, as the navigating officer of the Indian naval ship Bayas, Nilgiri, Ranveer and Vikram. His other sea tenures include commanding officer of INS Polish and Ranveer and executive officer on board INS Brahmaputra. Among his above tenures, among his short tenures, the important ones include staff officer ops uh, at Naval Workup uh, work Team and uh, head of training team at the Defence Services Staff College Wellington. He also was the Defence Advisor at the High Commission of India in Singapore and Chief, of, Chief Staff Officer of the Western Naval Command. On promotion to flag rank, he has held important assignments of flag officer sea training first, Chief of Staff uh, uh, in the uh, Chief of Staff of the Southern Naval Command, and then flag officer Maharashtra and Gujarat area in flag rank of Vice Admiral. And he has been commandant of the National Defense Academy, uh, uh, Pune, and the <coughs> Vice Admiral was also the Deputy Chief of the Naval Staff before moving in and taking over as the Vice Chief of the Naval Staff. Uh, he's a graduate of the Defence Service Staff College Wellington and attended the Army Higher Command course at MAUF, as well as the Expeditionary Operations course at Quantico, Virginia, USA. Uh, I invite the Vice Chief to deliver the inaugural letters. Uh, Dr. Lilia Jasper, Air Marshal Mateshwaran, dignitaries on the stage and uh, off the stage uh, and dear students of the college. I must tell you I feel quite intimidated to be here. 
because with such luminaries uh, uh, about to speak over the next two days, uh, it's always a challenge to match up to their caliber. And the second thing is that I, have, I see some naval veterans who have been my bosses before. Admiral Shekhar Sinha was in fact the Commander-in-Chief of Western Naval Command when I was the flag officer of Maharashtra and Gujarat. Admiral Srikande who sits there, he has been an inspirational figure for me since the day I was a sub-lieutenant. Having said that, uh, I must tell you that uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here at Chennai. There are a couple of reasons for it. One, as Air Marshal Mathesuran mentioned, though a born Mallu from Kerala, I spent seven years of my wonderful life in a hostel in Sainik School Amaravati Nagar in then Coimbatore district of Tamil Nadu. And those are the most impressionable uh, years of my life and uh, therefore Tamil is my first language. I even today do my mathematics using the uh, Tamilian tables, not English. I knew this was coming. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here. It is very difficult. It's always very difficult to actually move out of Delhi in whatever job that you're doing. Uh, so it's always uh, becomes a challenge to come out of there. But we always look forward to moving out of Delhi. Yeah. Because Delhi, Delhi can be quite a horrible place. Uh, but having said that, uh, as I mentioned, it's a pleasure to come back to Tamil Nadu any day. And this is the uh, state from the coast of which in 1025 AD, Rajendra Choda I launched a naval expedition to sort the Vijayanagara Empire, which was then ruling the Sumatra island of Indonesia and the southern part of Peninsula of Malaysia, all of which was under the Sumatra, uh, under the Sri Vijaya Empire's control. So as a result, the Malacca Strait, which goes between Sumatra, Malaysia and Singapore, was in the total control of Sri Vijaya Empire. And as to why this uh, expedition was launched uh, is not too clear because uh, history was not recorded uh, very clearly those days. <coughs> but we have uh, Dr. Sakuja sitting in the audience here. Uh, in uh, one of his books, uh, From Nagapatnam to Swarnadipa, if you read, uh, it also brings out as to one of the reasons was the fact that the Sri Vijaya Empire was levying higher taxes on the trade which was passing through the Malacca Strait and this trade was between the Fatimids empire of Egypt, the Cholas of Tamil Nadu and the Song dynasty of China. Now why I started with this example is because there are two things that stand out quite clearly in this. One is trade and second is the importance of controlling choke points and these two have not changed at all over the period of history. If you were to look at trade, for example, uh, the, the books uh, that, have, that were just released pointed out as to how there were linkages across right from uh, Haifa to uh, Hanoi on the east, which is the actual fact. That historically, if you see Indus Valley civilization traded all over the place. We had Lothal which was a thriving port and the largest ever ship repair facility, a dry dock which existed. This we are talking about 3500, 4000 uh, BC. And then there are many such examples. If you were to look to uh, trade with Magan in 550 BC, 6th century BC, between Greece and India during the Mauryan era, artifacts and archaeological finds which have been found in Africa which support this theory, the Hippalysis uh, direct route from the Red Sea to India. Earlier, the route that used to be taken was once you left the Red Sea through the Gulf of Aden, you coasted along the Omani coast, went across the Makran coast and came down along the Indian coast to various Indian ports. But Hippalus came out with this theory of the direct route because those days the navigational systems were not as advanced as they are today. And this Hippalus' uh, theory was also quoted in Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, which was written somewhere in the first half of the first century AD. And that not only mentions the direct route, but it also mentions as to how there were warships, ships, which were provided as escorts to merchant ships carrying critical cargo. So these things existed even then. And then we've got a whole lot of examples. There is a mention, in fact, uh, of Pumbuhar, 
and other ports uh, of India in the first century Roman report. Then of course you know of Madurai dealing in trade with Cleopatra's Egypt in first century BC. The pre-colonial uh, era trade, one example that I gave of uh, Srivijaya Empire and the attacks that happened, there was considerable amount of trade uh, that, was, that was being dealt with. So this actually shows that historically most trade passed through or passed to or traveled to ports in the Indian Ocean and with specific reference to India. Now if you, if you were to check kind of fast forward and come to today, today we have a situation where the Indian Ocean despite being smaller than the Atlantic and the Pacific, more than one third of the population lives in countries of the Iowa littoral. And not only that, 1,20,000 ships on an annual basis crisscross the international shipping lanes of the Indian Ocean region. And over these shipping lanes, what is carried is about 66% or two-thirds of global oil, 50% of container traffic and about one-third of the cargo. When it comes to natural resources, 28% of fishing is done in the Indian Ocean region. And yet, there is potential for a lot more. In fact, the joke goes that it is only in the Indian Ocean that fishes die of old age because nobody catches them. But yet, it caters for 28% of fish catch in the Indian Ocean. There are mineral exploration sites in southern Indian Ocean region which are allotted to four different countries. In fact, India is also one of them. China is one of them. Korea, Germany, all of them have mineral uh, research areas uh, for uh, polymetallic sulfides and nodules and things like that. And that area is about 75,000 square kilometers. Now, in all this, I, I mentioned about this 1,20,000 ships per annum through the international shipping lanes of the Indian Ocean. Interestingly, about 27% of this trade is amongst the Indian Ocean littoral countries. So, nearly 75% is actually external. And that is what gives Indian Ocean the strategic importance. Now, actually, if you see these international shipping lanes, or what is called the ISLs, are actually the lifelines of global economy. All the advanced economies and those which are uh, developing, all of them are dependent on the safety and security of ships that crisp pass through these international shipping lanes that crisscross the Indian Ocean. They are dependent mainly on the Middle East oil. You are aware as to how five of the top ten major oil producing nations are situated in the Middle East. So this dependency is not cannot be wished away. That, that's one reason why, uh, as they say, when the Middle East sneezes, the whole world catches a cold. Now the situation is also exactly uh, quite the same. If you look at other parts, China, for example, more than 70% of its energy requirements are met through uh, shipping lanes in the Indian Ocean region, either from the Middle East or from the west coast of Africa. Uh, the Angolan oil uh, to China actually comes around the Cape of Good Hope and passes through the international shipping lanes through the IOR. And yet, as I mentioned, the second point in that uh, example of uh, Rajendra Choda that I mentioned is the vulnerability of choke points. Indian Ocean is a closed ocean and there are only so many choke points through which you can enter into or exit out of. Either it is the Strait of Hormuz or the Gulf of Aden or the Cape of Good Hope down south or the Malacca Strait, Sunda Strait, Lombok Strait or the Omai Strait. There is no other way of coming into or exiting out of the Indian Ocean region. So, there are countries which are extremely keen in maintaining the safety of sea lines of communication, especially through the choke points. You are all aware as to how in 2003, Hu Jintao, the, the then president of China said, coined this phrase called the Malacca dilemma, because they knew if Malacca were to have a problem, the entire East Asia would suffer because they are so dependent upon the essentially of the Middle East oil and plus the trade. There is considerable amount of trade, trade of the Chinese which goes through the Indian Ocean region the other way around, starting from China. So there are a number of solutions which are attempted to be found. For example, Chinese have been talking about the Isthmus of Kra Canal. You have probably heard of this. In the southern part of Thailand, cutting Thailand into two, separating south and north. 
so that the Malacca dilemma can be resolved. If you see a number of projects which are being undertaken are all to overcome this kind of a problem. If you see the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, with highways and pipelines running from Gwadar in Balochistan, Pakistan, to Kashgar uh, up north in Xinjiang province of China. Or if you were to look to the east in Myanmar from Chakfu port to Kunming in the Yunnan province of China, are all basically with the aim of overcoming this Malacca dilemma. In order to secure sea lines of communication, there are also dual use infrastructure which is being made. In any case, the first ever overseas based by the Chinese have been built at Djibouti. And the other dual use infrastructure uh, ports, if you see, whether it is Humban Tota, whether it is their desire to have one at the I Haven, uh, which is the northern part of Maldives, Chakfu, the example that I gave, or their investment in building a submarine uh, base uh, at Pekua, near Chittagong in Bangladesh, or at Bogamayo in Tanzania, there are a number of these ports which are actually dual use. I mean, the, the, the reason behind construction is the economic, but nothing stops them from being used for military purposes as well. But one point that I would like to make here is, if you were to compare the cost and the effort, you will find that the medium of sea is always the cheaper and the faster. Despite the fact that a number of pipeline, pipelines are now coming up, when you calculate the total amount of oil that will pump through these pipelines, even when all of these are commissioned, is about 25 to 30 percent. That means remaining about over 70 percent of the oil will continue to go through ships overseas. And the second part is that pumping through pipelines is about four to time, seven times the cost of transport of oil through ships. Essentially dependent upon the altitude difference between mean sea level and the height to which it has got to be pumped. Like for example, if they were to go from uh, Gwadar to uh, Kashgar, it's going to be frightfully expensive because it's got to cross the Himalayas. Similarly, if you were to say highways to overcome uh, the, the uh, sea transportation, even that you will find that the effort and the cost involved is much more overland. In fact, there was a trial run which was done in 2017 uh, to prove the CPEC connectivity. So there were about 100 trucks which ran, uh, which were moved from Gwadar to Quetta, and about 70 came from Kashgar to Quetta. It was just to prove the connectivity uh, metrics. But you can imagine if a ship were to pull into harbour with about 10,000 trucks. Oh, sorry, 10,000 containers, how many trucks will be required to move all this to and fro? That's why I mentioned that the effort and cost will always be in favor of sea transportation. And therefore, this 1,20,000 that I mentioned about will only continue to increase well into the future. Now, if you were to talk about India and the Indian Ocean, it is not without reason that uh, Indian Ocean has got names from India. Because Indian Ocean, historically, people traversed through it because they wanted to come to India. Most trade was with India. <laughs> Geographically, if you see, in fact, I would like to read out a quote from uh, Robert Kaplan in his book, The Revenge of Geography. He wrote, rather than eliminating the relevance of geography, globalization is only reinforcing it. Which is so true. India juts out about 1,000 nautical miles into the Indian Ocean southwards and just falls about 450 or nautical miles short of the equator. It's quite prominent when you look at the map. And with our two sets of island territories, Andamans and Nicobars to the east and the Lakshadweep and Minikoi to the west, our EZ totals to about 2.02 .02 million square kilometers. Now if the continental shelf claims were to be finalized, that would increase to 3.22 million square kilometers and which becomes almost equal to our land mass. That is the kind of waters that we can exploit. Our own trade, for instance, over 90% of our trade is over the sea. If you talk of oil, more than 80% of our oil, whether it is from imports uh, from, the, from the Middle East or wherever, or from our own offshore development areas, it's all over the sea. That is why 
it is so critical for us to ensure that the seas remain safe. Otherwise, economically, we can be brought down to our knees. Now, having said all this, let us now look at what I think are the threats in the Indian Ocean region. If you have to maintain safety and security of Iowa, what threatens us at the end of the day? You would have heard of Gulf of Aden piracy. Gulf of Aden is not the first place to be affected by piracy. Somali pirates were not the first pirates in the world. But if you see that area is so crucial, and so is the case with Malacca Strait, the Gulf of Aden is so crucial to India and to the rest of the world that nearly 45 countries have deployed their ships. You would have probably read in the newspapers about CTF 150s and the 151s and the EU NAV 4s and, and, and so on and so forth. These are all by and large fighting, illegal traffic, gun running, arms smuggling, drug trafficking and piracy in the Gulf of India. India too, the Indian Navy has deployed one ship since October of 2008 continuously in Gulf of Aden. As we speak today, there is a ship there avoiding pirate attacks on merchant ships. And the Indian Navy does not care whether the uh, flag is Indian or the crew is Indian or the cargo is to Indian, it doesn't matter. Even if it is to anywhere else in the world, like every other country, we will pro provide protection to it. The piracy if you recall, in 2009-10, moved east and come as far as Lakshadweep and Minikoi Islands. In fact, there was an occasion when four of the pirates were actually arrested from one of the beaches uh, in one of the islands of Lakshadweep and Minikoi. That was the time that the Indian Navy launched an operation called the Op Island Watch, and in which successfully pushed piracy back towards Somalia. And this piracy would keep coming uh, on and off. And one of the reasons for that is the IUU fishing. This is the other threat that in the region which is illegal, unregulated uh, fishing and unlawful fishing. And this IU fishing is what is creating all the problems for those fishermen who are not as capable some are, as some other fishermen from extra regional countries who would come and fish in these waters. You would have read as to how uh, there is an annual contract between Somalia and China giving 31 countries fishing permits within their EZ. Of course, the Somalian government would say that it is beyond 24 nautical miles, so it does not affect the fishermen. But at the end of the day, it is within the EZ. Malacca Strait piracy, which I mentioned. So the three littorals, Singapore, Indonesia and Malaysia, have taken some very strong actions. One of that is the Malacca uh, Straits Patrol. And there are two parts to it. One is the Malacca Strait Sea Patrol and the other is the Ice in the Skies Air Patrol. Both of these have ensured that the piracy has been kept under control in the Malacca Strait. We also have the RECAP, Regional Cooperation Against Armed Piracy. There are a number of countries which are uh, party to the RECAP and one such is India. I have mentioned about gun running, drug smuggling and, uh, uh, these, uh, and human trafficking. These are the ones which also, especially the gun running and uh, the, the hash track and the smack uh, way which is there in the Western Arabian Sea, which actually funds terrorism, uh, whether it is ISIS or the Al-Shabaab uh, in, in the Northeast Africa. Now, let me come to what measures India is taking to address these problems. There are three levels at which this is being addressed. One is at the conceptual level or at the policy level. And that is, you would have heard of Sagar, security and growth for all of the region. This is the Honorable Prime Minister's vision of Sagar for our country. And if you notice security and growth for all in the region, S, security is the first word in it. It is not merely because if it were to be growth and security, it would have been Gasar rather than Sagar. And Sagar sounds a little better. Uh, but it is also because without security, there would be no growth. And there are a number of things that uh, the Indian Navy does in order to meet up to the requirements of Sagar. We carry out, in addition to guarding our own borders and waters and, uh, and the likes, we also carry out EZ patrols of other countries. The Indian Navy conducts monthly EZ patrol for Maldives, once in six months for Seychelles and Mauritius, once in three months for Sri Lanka. And there are many more who are asking us assistance for carrying out joint EZ patrols. We carry out coordinated patrols along the international maritime boundary line 
and this is with our uh, countries with whom we share maritime boundary lines whether it is bangladesh whether it is myanmar whether it is thailand or indonesia which each of them we got what we call core packs bilateral and multilateral exercises there are innumerable number of exercises that we do with various countries million and miles million is a get together of navies which we have once in two years at port blair and for the first time ever in 2018 we also conducted a multilateral exercise with all the participating countries there were about 16 countries that part participated in 2018 version of milan and miles is nothing but milan exercise at sea i've already mentioned about recap there are capacity building and capability enhancements that the indian navy undertakes we have provided ships and aircraft to various countries who who requires such assets from us we also provide them with lot of training assistance we offer something like 1000 uh, vacancies in our training institutions for other countries and they would come here and do training with uh, indian officers and indian sailors and there one other important thing that i want to uh, tell you all is setting up of csrs the coastal surveillance radar system india has helped a number of countries in setting up their coastal Uh, surveillance radar systems and we have also gone ahead and signed white shipping technical agreements information exchange agreements with a number of countries the government has approved uh, over 30 countries for us to go ahead and sign with and we have already signed and operationalized with over 20 countries and some multilateral contracts as well like crimario in uh, madagascar or the vrmts uh, vrmtc in italy or the ifc singapore with all of them these are all multilateral contracts and we have uh, a technical agreement with each of these in order to ensure that we take the leadership role in so far as maritime domain awareness in this region is concerned the indian navy also launched and it was launched by the honorable uh, raksha mantri then uh, mrs uh, nirmala sitaraman uh, the information fusion center for the indian ocean region it's called the ifc iowa this was on the 22nd of december last year and the plan is to have international liaison officers who will be there for which some more infrastructure needs to be created that's going to be reality pretty soon this is all about sagar next if i want to tell you about is at the navy's level which is ions the indian ocean naval symposium this is something that was an indian naval initiative which came up in 2008 in fact 2018 last year we celebrated the 10th anniversary there are 24 member countries in the ion and eight observers who are extra regional to the indian ocean region and there are number of ion working groups iwg it's called in which there are clusters of countries which participate in the iwgs there is one on hadr which is a threat to us uh, to the to the region there is one on maritime information exchange there is one on maritime security and and so on and so forth for the first ever time bangladesh in 2017 conducted what is called the imsarx that is ion multilateral maritime search and rescue exercise so in which many countries from many ion nations uh, many ships from many ion nations participated in the navy participated with three ships and the aircraft uh, in the imsarx which is conducted by bangladesh we also conduct various other things as a, as a part of ions but that is now also a part of iora which is the political that i wanted to mention about so if you have sagar at the uh, apex level or the conceptual level or the policy level you got the iora at the political level and ions at the naval level so if you were to talk about iora this again is a regional concept the iora arc transformed itself into iora and today we got about 24 members in iora and interestingly the iora also started a working group on maritime security because they understood that maritime security was the primary requirement for growth of the region so the indian navy takes complete charge of this working group of iora in so far as maritime security is concerned we just recently conducted a maritime information exchange workshop and we have also adopted what is called the qs this is so that to ships of different countries meeting at sea don't kind of end up escalating things unnecessarily this is code for unplanned encounters at sea which is what is queues so we have adopted the wpns queues into the ions and to the iora as well 
So these are some of the things that I wanted to mention to you in so far as Indian Ocean, the recent developments is concerned, and the Indian Navy's wholehearted participation in each of these. So finally, if I were to just sum up and conclude, living in an era that is actually marked by great power uh, rivalry, you know, rising illiberalism, or in fact growing nationalism, the importance of Indian Ocean region is only expected to continue to rise. I'm sure the speakers will talk to you about uh, the, the coming in of Indo-Pacific replacing the Asia-Pacific or coming in of the Quad and where are we now and whether it is the Asia Reassurance Initiative uh, by the US which is now into, uh, you know, uh, signed into an act by President Trump all of which have got huge Indian involvement and that's continued to be so. And finally, the Indian interest will be as the Prime Minister mentioned in his keynote address at Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore 2008, we believe in a common rules-based order applicable to all individually and to the global commons. With that, I finish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it now, uh, I mean, uh, I thank the Vice Chief uh, for an excellent overview. Uh, nobody can be better placed and you can't hear from uh, a, a better uh, you know, analysis of the operational issues, the importance of sea lanes and the maritime uh, security importance, uh, the historical you know, linkages. I mean, nobody can be better placed than him to actually be with us and it's been an exception, exceptional you know, description that the, uh, that, uh, the Vice Chief has given you. I thank you for that. Uh, thank you, sir. I call upon Air Marshal M. Mate Swaran to now introduce Professor Kanti Bajpai, who will then deliver the keynote address. Uh, it now for, it's my turn to actually introduce our guest of honor, uh, Professor Kanti Bajpai, who is the Vice Dean and the Wilma Professor of Asian Studies at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in National University, Singapore. Uh, he's been very kind to accept our invitation and come here to deliver the keynote address. Uh, the uh, professor, nobody is better, you know, known for understanding India's foreign policy and national security than Professor Kanti Bajpai. Over the last three decades, he has, through his writings and research, contributed significantly to the growth of Indian strategic thinking. And he's a prolific writer, and he writes regularly on uh, a lot of international, uh, you know, uh, publications. And, and, he, uh, and his uh, strategic uh, you know, writings and uh, thought processes is thought of as a very, very important contribution to India's foreign policy narratives and analysis. Uh, he is a world-class academic, a respected analyst, a Saudi thinker on international affairs. Since 1989, he has taught in leading universities, including MS University of Baroda, Jawaharlal Nehru University of Delhi, Oxford University, and the National University of Singapore. Uh, he has also been, uh, you know, the principal or the headmaster of Doom School for over six years. He's passionate about the education part and he's spent, uh, you know, enormous energy in overhauling its curriculum to bring in international baccalaureate, modernize the campus and improve discipline and academic standards and, and he's, you know, looked upon as one of the pioneering headmasters of uh, the Doom School. Uh, before joining Doon School, he taught international politics at Jawaharlal Nehru University for nearly a decade, and uh, thereafter he moved to uh, uh, you know uh, different international universities, as I mentioned, Oxford University. Before joining the Lee Kuan University, uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Now, without wasting much time, it's my uh, uh, turn to invite Professor Kanti Bajpayee to deliver the keynote address. Hey, Marshall, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, in Chennai. I haven't been for a very, very long time and uh, I haven't been such, with such a large gathering of, of students for quite a long time. I teach uh, master's level students uh, now and um, uh, the audiences are much smaller. Uh, and what's particularly nice, uh, given our themes, a lot of it will deal with security and international affairs. Um, and to see so many women students in the audience is fantastic, I think. There's a lively debate in international relations on uh, the role of women in security, feminist approaches, uh, gender-based approaches to politics and international relations. 
and uh, I guess this is living proof that uh, there's great interest amongst uh, uh, women. I mean, I think I knew that already, but uh, clearly uh, it's nice to see uh, an audience full of uh, more or less attentive students. <laughs> I uh, had told uh, the Air Marshal I was going to speak on uh, geopolitical theories uh, leading up to the issue of India and the Indian Ocean. But then when I looked at the program this morning more carefully, I decided to throw my presentation out of the, uh, the window and do something completely different. So I'm just going to speak from uh, a page of notes uh, on an issue that I think, uh, in a way, uh, it's in the title of this conference, and it may help uh, uh, us think uh, uh, carefully about um, the topic in a fairly systematic way. And the question I'm going to raise, which is uh, implicated in the, in the title is, what is a region? We are talking here about the Indian Ocean region. Um, the idea of regions has always been a very contested one, so I won't pretend that uh, there's a very clear cut answer, but it seems to me that if uh, one looked around uh, at the literature on regions and commonsensical thinking, common sense is usually a very good place to start, um, we can actually make some pretty good headway into this idea of, of uh, region. I'm talking to uh, colleagues uh, this morning, Solon Banerjee and uh, 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 Vijay Sakuja, uh, about conceptions of regions, and um, they kind of encouraged me to, to throw my script away uh, and to talk about something rather different. So I hope that's okay. Anyway, it's probably too late, so uh, I'm embarked on it. So what is a region? Uh, we talk about regions within countries, and we also talk about international regions. Uh, here we're talking about an international region, but I would say that uh, very broadly, uh, the conception of uh, region both domestically within countries and outside uh, have three elements uh, which are in common, although clearly uh, one would depict them differently. Before I go any further, I should say, of course, that I guess when most of you think of, a, of the idea of a region, you think of uh, a land. Uh, you think of the geographical space being a, a space that's on land. But of course, we can think of regions as being a, a, water, a water space, uh, a hydrological space instead. And so in that sense, uh, the first point I think uh, I'll throw out there is that, of course, geography matters. We're trained to think that regions are defined by bounded, enclosed land spaces. But in fact, there's a good body of historical and conceptual work that sees regions as being really defined by some kind of a large water body. Seas, oceans, we think of the Mediterranean Sea, there's very famous French works uh, Dr. T.C.A. Raghavan is a historian uh, and a diplomat, and you remember the work of the famous uh, French uh, uh, Annal historians on the Mediterranean Sea as a kind of uh, region with its own history and dynamics and so on. And so, of course, the, the first proposition uh, throughout is that uh, one can think of the Indian Ocean region uh, as this large water space, and obviously that's the that's the way that the seminar has uh, thought of it. So in what way could one think of any kind of space as being a regional space? I think it's quite useful to go back to the origins of the word region, which has its roots in the Latin, uh, and my Latin is not very good, I'll try to pronounce it, uh, as regere or regere, uh, which means to rule or to control. So the first thing one can say about a region is that it's a, an enclosed space of some kind uh, that is a place that someone wants to control or rule. And who is that someone? I mean, presumably, some center. So within a country, we think of a region as being defined in relation to a central government. And the regions, in India, we call them states mostly, uh, we do also have regional councils, which are groups of states, uh, but it's defined in re relation to a center, which is Delhi, which is our capital. Likewise, in international relations, if one were to ask uh, 
of who is this center that seeks to rule uh, or give expression to or divide the world up into regions, one answer is that it's the great powers or a great power, if there is a singular great power. And so if you look at the nomenclature of many regions, uh, these are not native to the area at all. Uh, they come from some domineering, dominating center. Uh, we have the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, which affirms a space called South Asia, which we take to be this uh, group of seven or eight countries uh, together. And in a way, it, it wants to keep everyone else at bay who is not in South Asia. Where did this term South Asia came from, come from? I think we know now that it was invented in the U.S. State Department. Yeah? Here's a, a very concrete example of the delineation and naming of a region by a domineering center. This term South Asia is not a term that grew up in South Asia. It was given to us by an outside bar. Likewise, the term Southeast Asia, since I come from Singapore, uh, uh, and since we're talking naval matters, it was Mountbatten's command in the Second World War, the Southeast Asia Command, SEAC, uh, that really gave the name to this region called Southeast Asia. There are all kinds of other names for what is uh, now the region that's known as ASEAN. But in fact, again, uh, a dominating uh, center, the, the Anglo-American powers in World War II, essentially popularized and gave expression to uh, the term Southeast Asia. So I think uh, a very important part of what is a region uh, is who names it and who uh, uh, kind of delineates and gives us its membership. Yeah? Uh, so we can't be innocent about uh, the term region and we shouldn't be innocent about the term the Indian Ocean region. I think uh, I would encourage everyone in the audience to think about the historical provenance or origins of the term Indian Ocean region, where it came from. Now it's quite true, that, as uh, 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 the previous speaker said, the Vice Admiral, that it got its name uh, the Indian Ocean because of the trade that came towards India, which was very, very important globally. But how we continue to think about this place as the Indian Ocean region may not be quite in our hands. And we already have increasingly a rival term, the Indo-Pacific, being uh, given to us. Uh, it has roots in India. Uh, Indian uh, theoreticians have talked about the Indo-Pacific. But uh, what I'm trying to get at is the issue of uh, the importance of memberships and, uh, and naming, uh, which fires our imagination about a region. And it comes from the powerful, usually, uh, and is not uh, a term that just uh, surfaces, uh, as it were, from below necessarily. Okay, so the first tip off about what a region is then, uh, given what I've said about the uh, desire for control, is that a region is a strategic zone. So it's a place that someone wants to control or some entities want to control. It's also being thought of because it's a place that people want to control and they're in contests over control, it's a war zone. It's a potential war zone. So regions often uh, are defined as war zones. One definition of our region, South Asia, which is current in uh, a very powerful country, the United States, is that it's that place where India and Pakistan fight over and over again. So when I was in a think tank in the Brookings Institution in Washington, uh, it was interesting that uh, the Americans who attended those sessions repeatedly actually used the term South Asia only to refer to India versus Pakistan. And I'm not talking about cricket matches. I'm talking about battles and fighting and war. Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka uh, was irrelevant to them. South Asia was a war zone. We're a, a dynamic about a, a contest that broke out into violence. That's what a region was for them. And you can think of many regions as being defined by war. The, the Southeast Asia Command of Mount Batten uh, really is what we now know as pretty much as East Asia, all the way from Japan through Southeast Asia into Burma. 
And when that Second World War ended, it was the zone that the Allies had to control against Japan to win the war. And once they won the war, it's quite instructive that Southeast Asia Command breaks up. That region breaks up into Northeast Asia, which is what? Which is the place where China, the Koreas, and potentially Japan fight, uh, with the Americans present, of course. Southeast Asia became, in many ways, uh, for 20 or 30 years, the place where the Vietnam War took place. I mean, there were other countries there, but from a strategic perspective, Southeast Asia was where the Vietnamese Civil War took place and then expanded into Cambodia and Laos. Uh, and I've already talked about South Asia as being, in some view, uh, the place where the India-Pakistan contest occurs. The Middle East is essentially where, from this perspective, Israel and the Arabs fight periodically, and so on. So the first thing I think about a region is that it's a strategic zone. It's a place that people want to control. There are contests over control, either by countries within or great powers without, that is outside and it can therefore be a war zone. But it's a zone of competition and conflict, and it's a militarized space. Yeah. The second conception of a region, which I think is in all your heads, so if I just asked you to define region yourself, I'm sure you would tell me that it's also a zone of interdependence. I mean, after all, a bunch of countries enclosed within some space are unified by uh, several things, but one of the things they're sort of brought together by, whether they like it or not, is that they are dependent on each other in certain ways. Yeah, and I think uh, our prime ministers in the past have said, uh, you know, you can't choose your neighbors. So, in a region, one of the ways in which you can't choose is you can't choose lines of, or patterns of interdependence. Some of them are historical and you do have choices. So one of the most common patterns of interdependence uh, in a region is of course economic. So the historical uh, antecedents to exchange and production and commerce and finance and so on. So these are deep structures that have existed between a group of societies that today have become nation states. Some regions have very deep contemporary lines of interdependence such as the EU or uh, even Southeast Asia and ASEAN and, and so on. And others had but broke them. So in South Asia, uh, obviously India, Pakistan and Bangladesh before 1947 as the Indian subcontinent had very deep lines of interdependence economically. But we chose to break them or at least countries within South Asia chose to break them. Pakistan in particular. But, I mean, if you generally look around at regions, they're defined by uh, patterns of interdependence economically, trade, finance, exchange, and so on. Um, but there's another very important realm of interdependence that pretty much every region has because they are contiguous countries enclosed in some way or cut off, and that is environmentally or ecologically. Uh, so, every region uh, has its particular kind of ecosystem usually. Land-based regions are very much defined by river systems. 40% of the world lives in shared river basins. I mean, you can't be much more interdependent than that. Yeah? And in South Asia, about three or four rivers really uh, define the region. The, the cis Himalayan rivers coming out of Tibet and the Hindu Kush and so on really define South Asia. And they're shared rivers. Whether we like it or not, uh, we're dependent on each other uh, in respect of what we do or don't do on those rivers. We can pollute them, we can deny them to each other, we can overfish them, uh, we can do all kinds of things with them. Uh, we can do them jointly or we can try and and do them uh, on our own. But we are fated to, to uh, share them. Likewise, the Himalayas is a common heritage of all of South Asia, and what happens up there, for good or for ill, uh, affects everyone in South Asia. So regions 
a water region such as the Indian Ocean region uh, has a very important set of interdependencies. There are wind patterns, there's the distribution of fishing, uh, there is, uh, of course, probably the most important aspect of interdependence now that we all face, potentially catastrophically, and that is climate change. This region, which has been connected historically through commerce, uh, through uh, finance, through movement of people, so migration is another area of interdependence that we will have, we've had historically. Um, this enormous Indian Ocean region, like so many others, is going to be the target of, the victim of climate change. We all know now that climate change is pretty much unstoppable. I mean, there's probably no prospect of stopping it at 1.5 degrees higher, 2 degrees higher, or even worse. And at least one challenge then uh, faces us in the Indian Ocean region, and that is the issue of adaptation. Yeah. Mitigation is trying to reduce carbon emissions and control the rise of temperature, but it may already be too late, in a sense, to, to deal with it. And so the other issue is adaptation. And I would suggest that the Indian Ocean region uh, is a massive zone where we have to think about adaptation together because there will be movements of people all across the littoral and across the ocean that's going to pr pr produce enormous challenges for all of us. One can imagine we're looking at the movement of people from Africa, Bangladesh and uh, Southern Asia all the way to Europe. They're already climate refugees. My schoolmate Amitabh Ghosh, the novelist, was in Singapore recently and gave a series of lectures. And uh, if you read his most recent book, uh, his novel, uh, Gun Island, uh, he talks about the presence of Bangladeshis and South Asians all over Europe. And if you recall um, the pictures at the height of the migration into Europe, uh, about three to four years ago when there was a crisis, uh, you'll note that uh, at that time, uh, we thought that most of the people who were going there were North Africans and Syrians and so on, but there were a lot of South Asians. And many of them were from Bangladesh escaping uh, you know, climate change. Uh, so the people who will move enormous distances, of course they're going there for better lifestyles and so on as well, but uh, climate change is going to force an enormous movement of people and it's not going to be restricted to within countries. As sea levels rise, weather patterns change, let's not imagine that all that's going to happen is that people are going to move in from Chennai into the, uh, within India uh, into new areas where they didn't live previously. They're going to take boats out. And they're going to come from uh, to India and away from India throughout this region. And I know uh, Arbinda Acharya later is going to speak about the challenges of migration amongst other things. I think in India we have to think about this problem very seriously. And the Indian Ocean region uh, is an enormous region of potential migration. It's going to be one of the hardest hit by climate change of all the regions because it's in such a, uh, a massive oceanic space which is very hot and sea levels are going to rise right across the region. So, another very important part of a region is uh, ecological and economic interdependence. The third part of uh, a region, which I think all of you would probably point to is, is some notion that it's a kind of a common cultural space. So regions are some sort of space of culture and identity. And within countries, we think of regions Southern India, I don't know what Southern India is completely culturally because there's so many different strands, but people throughout that are North India and we have a kind of cultural image of Eastern India. In the world too, uh, we associate cultures with regions. I think we have a, a picture in our minds of the cultural space that is South Asia that is somehow distinct from Southeast Asia. We're not quite sure what that difference is, but in our bones and in our kind of fingertips, we sort of have a sense of it, a common sense of it. So one thought about that is that uh, a region is a space of a common culture. So what is this 
this issue of culture. I mean, when we look around, even at our own country, uh, India, we have so many cultural streams. What to talk of a region? And yet, we got fixed in our minds that there's something typical about a region culturally or in terms of identity. So let me suggest that rather than think about a region as a homogeneous cultural space, actually, what a region is culturally is a space of cultural dialogue that's been going on for a very long time. And it's the particular contrasts and differences culturally uh, that define a region. So let me, I mean, I'm not a, a cultural historian, I'm a very distinguished professor and has fantastic volumes here. So I won't, uh, uh, I won't uh, say a great deal on this, but it does seem to me that, for instance, if you look at Southeast Asia, just a very commonsensical view might be that culturally it's that space where Buddhism, Hinduism, Sinic influences, uh, Arab influences, Muslim influences uh, have been engaged in an enormous, if you like, dialogue over a very long time. Christianity as well, of course. Likewise, one could say South Asia, with no disrespect to any religion, but one of the titanic kind of dialogues in South Asia has been the dialogue between Islam and Hinduism over 700 years at least, if not a thousand years already or more. And of course there are very other, other important uh, uh, dialogues in South Asia. We're in a, a Christian college and Christianity in South Asia goes back, as we know, over uh, 2,000 years or so. But one could say very crudely that regions are defined by a typical set of cultural dialogues, tensions, and so on. And one could pass culture at many levels. So this classical culture, which I think in a sense is the space of Professor Kalyan Raman and classicists who look at it, uh, there's popular culture, the everyday culture of ordinary people. If one looks at South Asia, one can see a very common uh, popular culture of food and dress and movies and sport and, and so on. Uh, but we may have cultural, uh, uh, classical cultures in a different kind of conversation. Uh, and then there's strategic culture, which is things that uh, people around this table do and in the audience who are military experts and so on. How do we think about the threats, the use of force, the place of violence, uh, what are the goals of, of societies to make themselves secure? How do we define security? I mean, I think there are different conversations in the region about that. Again, take the South, uh, South Asia. I think Bangladesh doesn't really militarize its conception of security. There's a much more economic or human view of security. Yeah? Uh, whereas, I think for India and Pakistan, security is national security. It's quite militarized. Uh, we don't need to apologize for that, it's just the legacies and, and the difficulties we've got ourselves into. But there are different strategic cultures within countries and across regions. And then there's political culture. In the modern period, we, we think about this in terms of some societies are democratic, some are more authoritarian, some are theological or religious based, some are more secular, etc. So what are the governing norms and values of societies uh, and what's the dialogue in a region on that score? You know, uh, in South Asia we have a conversation for a long time between monarchies that have now pretty much ended, republics, military governments, constitutional civilian governments, uh, and so forth. Uh, in the Indian Ocean region, if we are going to talk about culture and identity binding us, there are historical and classical cultures that kind of have linked us. There's a popular culture, potentially, I don't know enough about it, from Southern Africa all the way out to Singapore and beyond. Uh, there are commonalities there in popular culture. Sport might be one of them, but uh, I think there are other elements of film and music and dance and so on increasingly. Um, and then there's, there's strategic cultures that might differ, but of course there are political cultures that may be similar and, and different. Is there a typical, in the Indian Ocean region, are there some typical conversations 
about culture that we can identify that, that binds the, the region. So, um, it seems to me that uh, if we are going to talk about the Indian Ocean as a region, there are three ways in which we can talk about it, and I'll come to a, a point that uh, is probably in your minds, is whether these three are linked. So first of all, the Indian Ocean region could be a strategic zone that insiders, those in the area, and outsiders, such as China, such as the United States, such as perhaps Japan, or Russia, or the European states, want to control. A region, by the way, generally, if you look at the map, if we think of our typical regions today, they built around one major country. Southeast Asia, one could say, is built around, essentially around Indonesia, although Indonesia has not really asserted itself as a, a very bossy power. South Asia clearly is built around India, whether Pakistan likes it or not, or smaller neighbors like it or not. Uh, the Middle East, one might say increasingly, is that space around Israel. Uh, that may not be true always, but uh, East Asia, increasingly it seems that it's built around China, and so on. I mean, you can. So there's a contest in the Indian Ocean region between very powerful outsiders, one very big member state, which is India, and a whole range of smaller countries that have to deal with their relationship with this potential domineering regional state and a group of extra-regional powers who cannot be stopped from coming into the region when they want. Very difficult to stop them. So that's the first problem of the Indian Ocean region. How is that to be managed? What choices should India make? In a space like this, you've got three or four choices on how you manage it. The first is that there's a hegemon. A hegemon manages it. Does India want to be the hegemon, or does it want to be the junior partner of a potential hegemon? That's one choice. It's just a cold-eyed, theoretical look at what our choices are. At the other end of the spectrum is a completely negotiated order in this space, where small countries, mid-sized countries, India, and the outside powers uh, determine between them the rules of the game set of norms and institutions and so on that are more or less obeyed. Uh, and I think there's been reference made to the order being inclusive and rule-based uh, rule and so on and so forth. Can one have, there's a view in international relations, you can't have a rule-based system without a hegemon behind it. Just as in a domestic order, you have to have a powerful central government that stands behind your constitution and your rules. So that's not a trivial issue. Do we want that kind of rules-based order, or do we want a negotiated, multilateralized Indian Ocean region order that manages the relationship between great outside powers, India, and an array of small and medium powers around us? What would it look like? Um, in between those extremes, you have variants of sort of balance of power. I mean, one way you can get peace and stability in a region is have the great powers kind of check and balance each other. This is what ASEAN has done. In South Asia, we tried for a long time, led by India, to keep the great powers out, which is probably a futile idea. Our Southeast Asian neighbors who are far more practical decided to do the opposite, which is invite all the great powers in and have them sit at the table and balance each other off. So you could do it that way. Uh, you could have a balance of power. A variant of the balance of power is that you have spheres of influence. So you have two or three great powers that divide up the Indian Ocean region into areas and say, we'll take care of this part, you take care of that part, somebody else takes care of the third part, we don't cross over boundaries too much. These are theoretic possibilities, which way does India want to go? Uh, does India want to, in a sense, uh, make another choice which is simply non-aligned? Uh, that is, it doesn't uh, claim any great regional in, uh, uh, role of itself, and it doesn't side with any of the big powers. Uh, it works with smaller countries uh, to make sure we're not sucked into the contest of others, but we sort of step back a bit uh, and uh, try and exploit the differences between great powers for our own interest and work with smaller powers to make sure that the conflict between the big powers doesn't harm us. That's our own non-alignment. On interdependence, 
uh, how do you manage interdependence? You you uh, form institutions together. International relations theory tells us that uh, uh, institutions solve a collective action problem. Right? So everyone can recognize that we need to cooperate to solve environmental problems, water pollution problems, want to solve the climate issue, and so on. But we can't get there because everyone wants to be a free rider. Right? If the Americans can take care of it, why should I put my shoulder to the wheel? If the Chinese can provide a solution to climate change, why should the rest of us bother? If India can take care of the problem. So uh, one of the reasons we can't all combine, of course, maybe that we don't have a hegemon to force us all. But more interestingly uh, is that uh, we don't trust each other beyond a point. And institutions uh, are a way of trying to foster trust uh, where we hold each other accountable. And what allows us to do it is that we solve a market failure problem. If there are economists in this, I don't know, students must be uh, uh, learning about collective, uh, collective action problems and market failure. Why do markets fail? Why do firms not cooperate with each other? Because they don't have enough, their information costs are too high and their transaction costs are too high. And there's no one to enforce the rules, but I mean, <laughs> that's a given in international affairs. But uh, so you invent institutions to solve the problem of information uh, and transaction cost problems. You pool information and you agree on certain norms and so on between you so that you can solve, you can get to cooperative outcomes uh, by this rich source of cheap information that you pool together. So we could pool a lot of information on uh, the interdependencies we have in common in the Indian Ocean region as a way of getting to cooperation. And maybe some of the institutions that uh, the Vice Admiral pointed out, which is that, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, IORA and, 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 and many other Indian Ocean uh, organizations. These are ways of pooling information about intentions, capabilities, objectives, uh, fears, etc. So, Perhaps the Indian Ocean region needs to be a much more institutionalized space so that we can solve the problem of managing interdependence uh, together. The third is the, the cultural issue. I mean, inevitably, there's a cultural dialogue, but there are conflicts and differences. How can India and how can the states of this region uh, manage uh, culture, manage this dialogue uh, towards positive ends? Uh, I think that's an important part of what academics perhaps can do of various kinds, cultural ambassadors can do, foreign ministries, public diplomacy can do. But let's not be innocent about the, the culture games in the Indian Ocean region are already on. If you go to China, as I've been going over the last several years, you can go to very small towns and bigger cities and you will see already the extent to which uh, the Chinese are integrating the history of these places into a history of the Silk Routes. The land Silk Routes and the maritime Silk Routes. I'll give you an illustration. I was in Xi'an, where they're the famous terracotta warriors. And after looking at the terracotta warriors, I went to this roundabout, which has a famous uh, temple there, and there's a plaque. So all these historical sites are very well explained to visitors. And you can see very recently, they've taken this plaque and quickly inserted a reference into how Xi'an, but this particular historical site, was deeply a part of the overland Silk Route. Uh, and when we talked to Chinese colleagues, and we had a visit recently from a delegation of the Chinese Communist Party that deals with the Belt and Route Initiative, uh, they told us that the maritime silk route, which is the maritime route of BRI, and the overland land routes, uh, these have always been there. Uh, they were kind of China's collective gift. They were a net security and economic provider, uh, and it was a gift. And the famous journeys of Chen Ho, the admiral, in the, uh, at the end of the 14th century and early uh, 15th century, um, the Chang Ho provided order. There were all these warring states on the littoral here and there in Southeast Asia, 
in South Asia, uh, uh, in, in the region of Kerala, uh, as far away as East Africa and the Gulf, and Chang Ho settled their disputes. He brought the might of Chinese naval power and settled the disputes. This is a narrative, a cultural story that is being told about how the new Belt and Road is not, <laughs> is not something the Chinese state has just dreamed up in order to now construct a Chinese world order. It's always been there. Or it's been there for a thousand years. And so, what's the implicit message? It was accepted a thousand years ago. You know, please accept it again. We're not intruding into your affairs. We're not we're working with you as we have for a thousand years to make life better. Now, whether that story is correct or not, I leave to historians, but I mean, there are many maritime stories. I have a colleague at the school, and I'll just end here, uh, Marina Canetti, who's trying to look at all the different maritime stories that different societies are telling. And as she goes to museums, including in Kochi and elsewhere, every society is now claiming a maritime tradition uh, which sometimes touches the Chinese narrative, sometimes does not. Uh, so, there's a cultural dialogue on here about who owns the, or what role various societies have played in the maritime history of the Indian Ocean region. India has to think about how it's going to play a role in that dialogue. Are we going to accept a singular homogeneous view of the history of the Indian Ocean region, uh, its cultures and its peoples, united in a certain way, uh, or are we going to insist that there were many poles and regions and sub-regions and areas and stories that have come together and that as much as India and other societies gave out, they received from others. And that, in that sense, it's a very hybrid zone. I mean, all regions are, but so is the Indian Ocean region. Yeah. It's not necessarily India's gift, just because it bears the word Indian Ocean, but also it's not necessarily anyone else's domain. Uh, it was always a culturally, historically negotiated domain. Anyway, let me end. I mean, I think that um, one can see that this region has many, many uh, historical uh, conjunctures and streams. Uh, there are choices before India in how we participate in the Indian Ocean region. And of course the Indo-Pacific idea is another kind of regional construct that's already in play that dovetails with but also in some ways uh, challenges the idea of the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and that's the way the world is. Uh, regions are not once and forever. They overlap and they contest and they, they meld and they differentiate from time to time. And great powers regionally or outside help make those differentiations. Uh, and India as a great power will also be part of, 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 of that negotiation and delineation. So let me just stop there. I think a very broad choice it seems to me is in all these three spheres whether India stands for uh, a more singular hegemonic view of this region, or whether it will always insist on a much more pluralized, negotiated, dialogically respectful, uh, and kind of, uh, as the Prime Minister said, inclusive, uh, with a view to a kind of an open horizon, looking to uh, bring in spheres and ideas and so on, and work with them however challenging they may be. Uh, and on that score, let me just stop. I think uh, just to take advantage, I think uh, we can take a few questions from the, we can uh, pose a couple of questions to the professor, he'll be able to answer. Anyone? Yeah. Or to the uh, Vice Admiral aspect. This is to Professor Bajpai. Thank you very much. It was a lovely, uh, lovely scan of, of the complexities of the region itself. Uh, I just wanted to suggest here that even the term Indo-Pacific is actually uh, a Western uh, term, uh, perhaps first used by Karl Warshofer, uh, and it's been uh, quoted by uh, 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 Panikar in his book uh, sometime in the 1920s. But it's quite possible that you know it was even before that. So it's it's really not an Indian origin 
and, and, and not used by, by uh, you know, Prime Minister Abe also around, around the same time, 2007. Uh, the other aspect is of course that as an idea, the Indo-Pacific has, uh, has existed uh, from our own ancient times like the Vice Chief brought out. Uh, the, the, uh, and uh, throughout history, whether it was the Vasco da Gama epoch, you know, the, the uh, connectivity of oceans between the Atlantic, uh, the Indian and the Pacific has existed both in the eastern direction and in the western direction. That's, that's the nature of the oceans itself and therefore the, like you ended with the complexities that come when one region and another region sort of uh, dynamically interact. So, you know, that was just a comment there and uh, that's it. Anyone? Yes? Students? Yes. Uh, to Professor, uh, respected Professor Hajfai sir, when sir said, told us that the meaning of the region is to rule or control. So there the question begins, is that a right to say um, that regions are related to rule or control? Or is it a narrow thinking? I may be purely wrong, but there is still the question remains. It is right to say whether the regions are meant to rule or control, sir. I guess you're asking. I guess you're asking whether it's morally right uh, or ethically right. Um, I mean, I, I think what I was trying to say is that whether we like it or not, uh, deeply implied in the word is a notion of control or command or rule. Uh, so whether we like it or not, regions are looked at as subordinate spaces in relation to a center. At least that's one very powerful view, historically arrived at view of a region um, within countries as well as internationally. And so it is, it's not a comfortable view because I think uh, going with the other two dimensions of regions, which is interdependence and culture, we think of it as a kind of comfortable domestic space where we kind of rule, where we're sovereign, where our dominant views, uh, cultural views or, or, or practices and institutions uh, where, where, where they dominate. So this view of regions is uncomfortable because it actually tells us that this domestic space that we think is such a safe space for us is actually not. It's a space that has been uh, given to us more or less by some powerful outsider. And as much as a region is a space that you know we may feel comfortable internally, Outsiders have boxed us in. It's basically saying, you are part of this region, therefore you're not part of that lot. And don't go there. That's not your space. So, regions in a way are containers. They're boxes to put people in that you can't get out of. Uh, that powerful outsiders don't want you to get out of. So, it's an uncomfortable thought that Regions are, are or tend to be the constructs of powerful outsiders. Thank you, sir. Yeah, any more? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, my last question is to Professor Kanti Baspai. That when you talk of a region, now I live somewhere in a place. I have a village around, and I'm used to the place. And that's what is uh, India is used to. Indian Ocean. And so there's a, there's a connectivity of name, region and the, the place where we live in, we are used to that. And when we see uh, external uh, you know, propositions there, we feel uh, unsettled, about, unsettled about it and then we, we question. Now, when you, the, the whole idea of uh, whole reconstruction of Asia-Pacific to Indo-Pacific that happened, now in between I think while Indians might not have been claimed so much of Indo Indo Pacific uh, imagination. It is the Indonesians also who have thought of it very excitedly. 
I mean, they are more excited that this is Indo-Pacific. They also have a connotation of Indo is Indonesia. And if you talk to the Indonesian uh, you know, maritime scholars, they always call it as Indonesian Sea. They don't call it as Indian Ocean, they call it as Indonesian Sea. Very clear and all that. So it's a matter of just being used to a, a place and accordingly the whole uh, name, uh, name and connotations and all that. So how do you configure it? That's my first question. My uh, question to Admiral uh, Sukumar is that um, I think Prime Minister uh, Modi uh, defined Sagar. I, I consider it as a very, very uh, intellectually very sound. It's a very profound uh, definition. Security and growth for all. I think it, it uh, you know, combines many, many you know, ideas together, both economic, security, growth, people, and, and so on. Now I wonder, you have been in the, in the, in the uh, naval corridor and the, the dialogue with the government and, and the, the naval uh, literature, all of that, you have been part of it. I wonder if this uh, definition emerged from the political circle in Delhi or for the security uh, in our corridor or a combination, where did it emerge from? I mean, it's a wonderful definition. That's where I would uh, request uh, Mural to come. Thank you. Now that you have said it is wonderful, I claim credit for it. <laughs> but having said that, um, uh, it really doesn't matter how it evolved, uh, you know, who came up with this coin. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, we have been involved in providing uh, security, cooperative security. I mean, it is not the intention is not for uh, India or the Indian Navy to go into uh, some other country and start doing something which that guy doesn't want. Or uh, so every uh, exclusive economic zone patrol that I spoke about is all joint. Uh, a ship which goes, say, for a easy patrol of Maldives would enter the harbour, pick up Maldivians, sail out with them, do a joint patrol under the command of the MNDF. And similar is the case whether the Seychelles, the Mauritius, wherever we go. Uh, Corpats are coordinated patrols with both navies together. In fact, the Indian Navy uh, uh, launched a concept called the mission-based deployments by which uh, naval ships are present in seven different uh, what we call the pole positions within the Indian Ocean region on a near continuous basis. Gulf of Aden is continuous. Malacca deployment is continuous. In some other places there is no necessity for us to be on a continuous basis but we, are, we remain there for near continuous uh, basis. In those situations as well the Indian Navy is quite open to extending invitations to the littorals of that region to embark B C riders participate in PASXs and whatever foreign cooperation initiatives that they want to undertake, uh, they are most welcome. Uh, so these are things that the uh, Navy has done pretty well and because of which not only have we now become the net security provider, we also have become the first responder. In fact, quite often I am asked uh, this question, who gave you this uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this name of being first security provider, uh, first uh, responder or the net security provider? So my answer to them is the others. We are not claiming it for ourselves, you know. So when a cyclone hits Bangladesh and the Indian naval ship which is deployed on the north depth in the northern Bay of Bengal literally follows the cyclone in, into Bangladesh and provides relief, we kind of become the first and only responders. Far away in Mozambique, when a cyclone hit, it was the uh, two or three Indian naval ships which responded immediately. And I can give you many, many such examples. So. Uh, so this is what our concept of security is like this uh, offense versus uh, you know collaboration that was also discussed uh, so we actually view it even in naval diplomacy there is coercive diplomacy which is kind of gunboat diplomacy uh, of your and which is benign diplomacy if you react to an HADR situation it is quite benign if you want to exchange maritime domain awareness information with this guy because of your presence there and you're picking up or you help him Petrol is EZ, which is unable to. A, a small country like Mauritius, and uh, you know, a group of islands has got more EZ than India because of the nature, uh, uh, because of the geography. You know, and, but we do not have the assets to kind of check out whether piracy is happening, illegal fishing is happening, whether drug running, and so on and so forth, which we do. Similar is the case with Maldives, and, and there are many such examples that I can give you. 
So irrespective of who coined that wonderful term, and I think it sounds nice, Sagar, which also means the oceans, uh, so security and growth, and security being the first, the Navy plays a huge role. Yeah, I mean, of course, the Indonesians think that in the Indo-Pacific, it's the Indonesian Pacific. <laughs> and they've been quite active. But I haven't heard uh, of them trying to rename the Indian Ocean as the Indonesian Ocean. They renamed a portion of the South China Sea as the North Natua Sea, but, uh, which got the Chinese very angry. But, um, but I, I haven't heard about... Uh, but they, they're sensitive to the naming of uh, the water bodies around them, obviously. Uh, any big, big country would be. Uh, and they have a stake in it too. So, um, but I guess the the larger point about uh, our comfort levels within a neighborhood and so on—that's exactly, I think, what we have to think about uh, in the Indian Ocean region. It, is that it's going to be a discomfort zone, uh, uh, both strategically in terms of interdependence, but also in terms of of uh, being a cultural space. And I I didn't address it, but I could say. But these three dimensions, I mean, they offer us some questions on, uh, again, Indian choices. Uh, you could build peace and stability uh, around any one of these three. You could say that if we solve the strategic problem here, between the great powers, India, and small and medium powers, then you've basically got the problem solved. And uh, managing interdependence and cultural stresses and strains or opportunities will will follow easily. Uh, others take the view that if you solve the interdependence problem first, you lay the basis for solving the strategic problem or uh, taking care of, of cultural issues. They follow it in, in the wake of solving these very big ecological or economic uh, interdependencies. Or anyway. But there are some people who think that uh, a culture is primary because culture answers questions such as who am I? How do I relate to others? What is the meaning of the actions of others? Is a wink just a wink? Is it a physical impairment? Uh, is it uh, sharing a joke between two people? Uh, is it something that's naughty and lascivious? Uh, I mean, there are many interpretations of that, that act. Uh, and what allows us to distinguish between it, those, those meanings is some sort of context that we call culture. It's a cultural moment. So, how do we how do we decipher what the intentions of others are? Uh, what is our relationship to them? Uh, who are we? Uh, maybe these are the most primary issues in a region first that have to be sorted out. Uh, and economic and ecological interdependencies and uh, strategic problems will kind of be solved uh, uh, as a result of that because those are all framed within questions of identity, culture, belonging, uh, othering, and so on. Uh, so again, I think we have to think very profoundly about, I mean, an easy way out is we try and tackle all three at the same time, but resources are scarce, so you have to kind of make a choice about which, which area you're going to place your bets on in terms of policy. Thank you. Uh, I think we are running out of time, and we need to move into the closer session. Uh, please give a big hand for the exceptional. <laughs>